Today, my guest joining me on the Business Chat podcast is Andrea Newton from the UK, and her business is called Confident Conversations. Welcome to the show, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How lovely. I'm really looking forward to diving into this chat and I've been reading a lot lately about conversations, you know, conversations that matter, courageous conversations, challenging conversations. And every time I read another article or a book or listen to a podcast, you know, every time I listen and I I'm reminded of a time where I should have, could have had a conversation. (laughs) And then the outcome may have been different, in, usually in a more positive a positive light. So I'm really keen to find out a bit later on after we found out about you, you know, why is it that, that we don't have these conversations that are so necessary? What is it that we're afraid of and how can we do it better? But we'll start mm. at the very beginning. So the very beginning, Andrea, <laughs> tell us about yourself and uh, how what you first started in and how you came to be doing what you're doing now, which is helping leaders and organizations to have significant conversations. Mm, Thank you. Yeah. So I've been in and around the corporate world doing that for about 26 years now, which is amazing because I'm only 27, Lisa. Um, But I (laughs) seem to have been in, in the corporate world for quite some time. And my background originally, I came from a a role in HR where I was supporting line managers in an international logistics company. And I got involved in the training side of HR, um, helping people in, in kind of different areas, leadership, management and so on. And one of the things that I really recognize is exactly what you said there, how so often issues weren't being tackled. Managers were nervous about addressing performance problems. Um, People were manipulating situations with poor attendance. And inevitably, the manager would come to HR and say, can you just have a word? And so I started to build in to the training that I was doing. At the time, I called it Tough Talk because I felt that Mm. they found it really tough to talk sometimes. Um, And it's really kind of grown from there into today. I work with what I call seven significant conversations that I believe all leaders, managers, HR professionals should be skilled and confident in having. And so in a nutshell, uh, for the last 20 odd years, I've been kicking around helping literally thousands of managers to develop the skill and confidence. Um, And because of a conversation that I didn't have that I should have had, um, I actually ended up in a state where I was suicidal. And so once I recovered, I actually went and qualified as a tutor in suicide intervention because Mm -hmm. that for me is one of the most critical conversations. Um, And so I operate right across that, that spectrum from helping newly promoted managers get confident all the way through to helping people have situations, uh, have conversations in situations of crisis. Um, You know, if we have got somebody who is feeling really overwhelmed, how do we help Mm -hmm. them? So yeah, that's that's me. And it's fascinating, isn't it? How, you know, human behavior is so fascinating, how a a conversation, if it's well-planned and and people have got the support and the tools to be able to do that and they know the outcome, you know, it can literally take a few moments. And yet, you know, how, how much time do we spend dancing around the issue or walking on eggshells or putting in other support systems in place? And there's one example, I can remember working in, in a team and there was one particular employee and this person had sort of been batted around from team to team to team because of underperformance. And so here we were with a person that was performing at less than capacity. We all had to take on an extra portfolio. We all had to uh, redo work, recheck work, review work, whilst being very sort of sensitive around it. And it just builds resentment mm. it, and 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 then friction between the team because you know it's not right and you think what are HR doing about it you know what are the 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 managers doing about it and it can be a a, a real source of of frustration so andrea 
why do people shy away from these significant conversations and what happens if we if we put them off or we just don't go there i think over the years um lisa what i've come to realize is there's a real host of reasons why um i think the the most common is as human beings we like to be liked and we don't like conflict or the risk of any confrontation or people not liking us or us being seen as the bad guy or being seen as demanding so I think that's that's kind of one of the fundamental things. As human beings, we don't necessarily enjoy being in that situation. But I think I've also learned that there's lots of other things. Managers often haven't had any training, haven't had any development in this area. So they fear getting it wrong. Um, that could result in a grievance. It could even result yeah. in a, an employment tribunal if the person feels mm. that, you know, the way they've been managed is, is bullying or discriminatory. So there's that yeah. fear. There's dependent on the culture within the organization. Um, if I go to tackle this, will I be out on a list? Will I get the support from people around me or will they all run for the hills when it gets a bit messy? And the example you gave there of everyone working around someone, I'd like to say that was really rare, but actually it's not. I come mm. across that a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, rather than have a difficult conversation, we go out of our way and we we compensate for people. We, um, you know, sort of turn a blind eye oh it's just Fred it's just today it's you know and I think a lot of it is we could summarize it all as fear of the consequence fear yeah. that you don't like me fear that I get in trouble with HR fear that you accuse me of picking on you um, fear that it'll all go badly wrong and I won't get any performance out of you so for me it's it's fear in one way or another um, yeah. And there are there are some significant risks and costs to organisations yeah. if these things are not being tackled. Um, you know, the, the most obvious is poor standards because people yeah. are not getting the feedback. As you said, resentment amongst other colleagues yeah. who are perhaps having to work twice as hard to compensate. You therefore risk staff retention. You risk losing your talent because they get fed up. Yeah having to, you know, carry Fred or whoever, Frida, whoever it yeah. might be, um, as well as your reputation, your reputation as a business, but also mm. your reputation as a leader, because I can see that you're not dealing with Fred. Yeah. So what mm. does that tell me about your leadership? And if you use, you know, that state of the nation where we gather everybody together and we say, I just want to remind you all about the importance of timekeeping. And everyone's going, mm. we know who you mean. Why aren't yeah. you talking to Fred? And so I think there's so many costs and risks at every level, organization, managerial, team level, and certainly to customers, clients or service users. Yeah. yeah. So because the, the primary barrier is this fear of the, the consequences, good planning and support early on, I'd imagine is key before you even go into the conversation. So, and it may be that somebody who is just learning to do this effectively mm -hmm. has sort of put it off for a little bit. You know, these things yeah. don't get better. They tend to escalate a little mm -hmm. bit. So then they're finally they're finally at that stage where right i need to do this i need to have this conversation it's going to be uncomfortable i need to do it anyway so what are those very very fundamental first steps in the planning phase to make sure that you set it up right mm. i have um what i call stepping stones to successful conversations and the very first is to start with the end in mind what do I want to achieve as a result of this conversation? I think we need to be absolutely crystal clear about what our desired outcome is, not necessarily how we get there or what the solution is that gets yeah. us there, but being clear about actually what does good look like? What do I really want? Because again, I see often through lack of that preparation, people get into conversations, come out the other side, and they're not much better off, but they've just gone through a really difficult, challenging time time. Um, I'll give you an example. If you've got a member of staff that's arriving late at work and they keep arriving late and whenever they arrive late, they don't apologize. And so it's starting to frustrate you. 
So you think, right, I need to talk to them about this. But let's be clear, what do you want? Do you want them to apologize when they're late? Do you want them to stop being late so frequently? Do you want them to just stop being late? Do you want them to feel told off? What do you want to achieve as a result of the conversation? Um, because if you're not clear on that from the outset, as I say, you could end up going down a completely different path whereby you agree it's OK to be late as long as you apologize when you get here. So yeah. start with the end in mind and also make sure that you are in the right frame of mind for this conversation, because if you have delayed or put it off, chances are your emotion, your frustration around it may yeah. have grown which means that as soon as you open your mouth, what comes out is wrapped in that emotional overspill, which is not conducive to successful conversations. So yeah, so there's, there's 10 stepping stones that I would always advocate. Start with the end in mind um, and you know, really prepare, plan, think about the other person yeah. and do some little kind of work with that inner voice in your own yeah. head. Yeah, sounds like a, a solid, a solid starting plan. I love, I love that. So Andrea, how do we prepare the other person? Because we don't just go, Hey, I want a word with you right now. I'll come in the office. We've got to, you know, how do we approach that so that we can set the context and we can also make sure the environment is, is safe for both parties. And again, timing and environment are both part of the preparation steps, um, because whatever this person's done or not done, they still deserve to be treated with respect. They deserve to be treated professionally. So what I'm not going to do is suddenly leap all over you in the middle of a busy office and, you know, start sharing feedback you know in, in that situation so think about the time think about the place and then I always use the analogy the same as when you're driving signal your intent because if you don't signal your intent and I, I don't know what the the situation is in Australia Lisa but we certainly have BMW drivers here in the UK that never use their indicators mm -hmm. so we never know whether they're going to suddenly turn off um, yeah. and so if we don't signal our intent and people are taken by surprise, you have to therefore expect an emotive reaction. Yeah. And that isn't what you want. You know, you want to have a resourceful, rational, adult, adult dialogue. And yeah. you can't have that if you don't respect the other person. So perhaps saying to somebody, I've got a bit of a concern and I wondered if you and I could find five minutes to talk about it and if see if together we can't find a solution that works. Because I'm signaling my intent, I have a concern. Mm -hmm. I'm inviting you to dialogue in a way that's respectful and polite. And I'm making it clear to you that my intention is good because it's solution focused. So I'm not inviting you in so that I can give you a good telling off. Yeah. I'm concerned about an issue. I'd like to talk to you about it, explore it together so that together we can agree a solution that moves us forward. Mm -hmm. So you would uh, you would have that in a conversation rather than send somebody an email so there's a record of it or does it depend um, on the person? I think it depends on the person, it depends yeah. on the circumstance because I think all of us, Lisa, however confident we are, if we get an email from the boss that starts with, I'd like a word with you. Immediately, yeah. our head goes to a place of, oh, what have I done wrong? Which means yeah. that we are not in a good state for that conversation. So yeah. I think it very much depends. And one of the key things is really the quality of the relationship that you have with your team in the first place. Yeah. You know, as, as a leader, you have a significant responsibility there to develop that relationship so that you can have honest conversations with their permission yeah. and, you know, respectfully. Yeah, so it almost needs to become part of that team culture. Uh, a couple of episodes ago, so episode 31, I interviewed Michelle Bahari and we talked about leading above the line and mm -hmm. the above the line and below the line behaviours. Okay. Yeah. And I think that if if as a team you set you set what those expectations are, because ideally we want conversations that matter or, or confident conversations to become normal. Yeah. So that when somebody says, Can I have a word? Um, can we talk about something that has been brought to my attention or however you want to word it, that people don't suddenly get mm -hmm. 
the the fight or flight response and start sure. panicking and thinking yeah. yeah yeah and that that relationship is so important and you know one of the conversations i i train is um conversations around mental health because we need to recognize that mental health and psychological safety are absolutely part and parcel of yeah. performance and if we're not creating a climate where those two things are supported effectively we can't mm. have honest open frank dialogue without there being significant risk so we've got to work on that climate and yeah you're absolutely right above the line behavior um for sure yeah so andrea you you have created seven significant significant conversations can you share uh, can you share a couple of those yeah sure um i mean the, the the framework really looks at if you almost imagine um maslow's pyramid that starts with yeah. a really broad wide base and goes through to um a much sort of narrower it starts with confident conversations i believe that yeah. every single leader needs to be confident to have conversations that matter whether that's about simply giving people direction or instruction yeah. whether that's making decisions um because i do think that sometimes that transition from mate to manager can be quite a challenge so people yeah. who are newly promoted need some development at that point and then really um, within the seven we talk about the importance of challenging conversations and yeah. that might be you may have to give your boss some feedback you may need to have a conversation with your boss you may need to have a challenging conversation with a colleague perhaps they're doing something in a way that you know really isn't comfortable for you or a challenging conversation with a supplier or a contractor so it's not mm. always about conversations with your team. It's recognizing as a leader, 360 degrees, the importance yeah. of different conversations. So confident, um, caring conversations. We both know that people will only value the business if they feel the business values them. And so how do we let people know that we care about them without becoming their mother, their counselor, their, their social yeah. worker? You know, what does that look like? What are the professional boundaries? Um, and then obviously the, the two more crisis and critical mm -hmm. conversations that I reference are to do with conversations about mental health. Um, and mm -hmm. I think given the really unsettling period that we've yeah. all gone through with a global pandemic, um, absolutely mental health should be on the agenda and it should be something that managers feel comfortable to support and signpost. Um, yeah. And obviously in situations where it's become critical, as I say, I'm, I'm also qualified in suicide intervention. And so uh, certainly, again, through the pandemic, mm. we've been doing lots of work with organisations just to help them be ready if such a situation were to arise, because you know, we need to remember not everybody who's having thoughts of suicide will be stood on the bridge staring yeah. down into the water below. They could be sat opposite you in a disciplinary hearing. Yeah. This could be the person that's receiving a redundancy conversation, you know, and you're just yeah. putting the end to their world. This could be somebody yeah. who's really struggled with COVID and they've had some really mm. personal challenges. So we need to be creating a climate within our organisations where whatever needs to be said can be said yeah. with compassion, with curiosity and with positive intent. Andrea, do you recommend that for maybe not all, but some of these significant conversations that there's a third party there, you know, how do we make sure that that there's accuracy and that things are, are, are documented and that the environment, you know, stays safe? Would you recommend a third person, a third neutral person? To be honest, I'm not a fan of having more people than than we need to, unless, of course, you've moved into a more formal process. So if it's turned into a disciplinary investigation where the individual has the right to be accompanied and you would generally have someone from yeah. HR, I would much rather encourage managers to develop good relationships with people so that we don't need that third party. Yeah. Um, there may be issues that are particularly sensitive where you may think actually the person would feel better supported by having someone. Um, but to me, fundamentally, let's work on the relationship we have with people so that I don't need to be observed, supervised, you know, refereed, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. And then how do you how do you then hold people accountable to what's been decided during that 
that conversation i mean people yeah. may see say things when emotions run high and, and and then they might walk out of the door and carry on doing whatever it was that's happening before so okay. how do you how do you plan for that mm. and that's one of the areas that i do think managers most frequently fail to do well um, I think sometimes people walk away from the conversation going, well, I'm really glad we've had that chat and um, yeah. I'll leave it with you because we're almost so relieved that we've got through yeah. the conversation unscathed that we're just happy to get out of it. And I always say what we need to do is when we agree an action, we also agree a review. So I might say to you, Lisa, um, it's great that we've been able to have this conversation and I'm delighted that you've suggested X, Y, Z as a way forward. Tell you what, why don't we get together again a week on Friday at two o'clock and let's just check in and make sure that that's working and that we don't need to tweak it. Because what I've done there is I've given you a time scale. So I'm really clear in terms of by when I expect to see an improvement. Yeah. By setting a review date, you know that I'm going to follow up on it. And thirdly, what I've also said without saying it is, I mean it, this yeah. isn't just a conversation in passing. I really expect to see this change happen. And then we need to be prepared to follow up with that review. We're often scared to deliver a consequence. Yeah. And so, you know, I'll, I'll meet managers and they'll say, this is the 18th time I've spoken to them about this issue. And I'm like, mm. well, clearly you're not doing it very well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we, we need to be clear about having the action plan with a review and consequence, if not. It's like having kids. If you tell your kids that they can't have ice cream until they've eaten their vegetables, but then you give in and give them ice cream anyway, there's no consequence. So why should I do yeah. things differently? Yeah, yeah. And, and what, um, what tips do you have for if the conversation doesn't go quite as planned so i'm thinking about you know a situation where you know one person has the issue that they want to talk to the other person about and then that becomes well you don't like it that i'm late i don't like it that your desk is untidy or that you okay. do this so it it just becomes yeah, uh, yeah. unproductive I, I call them hand grenades Sometimes people will yeah. throw things into the conversation yeah. to sometimes it's just about creating a smoke screen, but sometimes yeah. those hand grenades can be quite explosive mm. and can actually derail the conversation completely. Right. So mm -hmm. in the training I do, I specifically talk about managing hand grenades. And I have yep. to say a lot of it comes from the preparation that you do. Um, right, yeah. making sure that you've got facts, you've got the history, you've got specific behavioral examples that you can use, thinking about the person, because let's be honest, Lisa, lots of people have their preferred drama, their preferred yeah. script. Yeah. So in some ways we can almost anticipate, um, but it's about remaining assertive. And it's about me saying, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that, Lisa, but today we're here to talk about you. If there are issues elsewhere, let's make a note of it and let's talk about that tomorrow. But today, can we just focus on this? Because the fact of the matter is, mm. and it's about staying calm. It's about staying in control. It's about focusing on that adult, adult dialogue. And it's yeah. also about being prepared sometimes to say, look, I can see that this feedback has come as a real surprise to you. Why don't we take a few minutes? Let's go and get a coffee, uh, give you an opportunity to reflect, mm. and then we can get together again. And, you know, sometimes it might be about taking a break. It might be about being respectful. Yeah. Emotional intelligence isn't just about managing my emotional state. Yeah. It's also me being mindful of yours. Yeah, I like that. It shows that you not only respect the other person, but also that you that you care. Mm. Yeah, because, again, if you think about signaling your intent, you yeah. knew that this conversation was coming. You've prepared for this conversation. You've thought about this yes. conversation. Yeah. Yeah, we should never be surprised if another person reacts emotionally mm. because they haven't mm. had the same time to be resourceful, to be rational and to think about it. And, you know, especially if you've picked up a team, you don't know how they've been managed previously, but you notice there's a performance issue or an attendance issue or a conduct, whatever it might be. If nobody's ever told them before that that's a problem yeah. because of all those fears, 
and you mm. suddenly now start to say, I'd like a word with you. We have to accept that another human being may initially react emotionally yeah. rather than respond rationally. And so we yeah. need to manage that situation better. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I can remember many years ago, I worked in the public service and there was an issue with somebody underperforming, but every time either the line manager or the senior manager tried to have the, the conversation, and, and, and I think that they did a reasonable <laughs> job at, at setting this up and it would end up in the person uh, dramatically bursting into hysterical tears and picking up the phone and getting picked up to go home. And then we wouldn't see that person for about a, a, a month. And yeah. then, so the manager was like, see, this is what happens. So <laughs> it's and tough. Those, it can that's be tough. exactly, <laughs> you know, those are those hand grenades. That person obviously had a well rehearsed script. You knew what was going to happen when you did yeah. that. And that was just their way of manipulating the situation. I, I had mm. a similar with a lady that, you know, whenever the sun was shining, which is, is quite rare in Manchester, but whenever the sun was shining or last minute Christmas shopping yeah. or Wimbledon fortnight, she'd go sick with women's troubles right, because yeah. she knew that her male manager would rather yeah. chew off his own arm than talk yeah, about her yeah. gynecological appointments. But it, it was all a smokescreen. There was nothing wrong yeah. with her, but she developed a strategy that meant other people mm -hmm. stayed mm -hmm. away from the issue yeah yeah and, there, and there's a real fine line isn't there between sticking to you know, um acknowledging people's rights and their roles and their responsibilities and their entitlements and and the the diverse environment that we create and the culture of belonging and all those things and yet still having those conversations and, and not being afraid to. Mm. We forget though, Lisa, that in us providing all of that, there's also an inherent part of the contract between two people that says, I will rock up regularly. I will yeah. do what you need me to do to the standard that we've agreed. And I promise to behave professionally in the workplace. That's so, true. You know, there's, all we're ever asking people to do is the job that they're being paid to do to the standard that's required. This should never be personal. It should never undermine any of that stuff that you've just listed, because yeah. actually all I'm asking you to do is your job that you signed up for, that you agreed yeah. to behave in a certain way whilst performing. And yeah. as your manager, I have the right to have that conversation. Um, you have the right for me to have that conversation respectfully, appropriately, within all of the parameters. But I have the right to ask you to do your job. Yeah. Performance, never personality. Yes. I, I love what you're saying, Andrea. It, it makes sense. And, oh, look, everybody needs to have one of you on their team in, as part <laughs> of the, the, the HR. <laughs> <laughs> that can help them navigate this. I mean, could you imagine if you if you had actually had somebody in in an HR role or on the team who was skilled as skilled as you are in being able to do this, even to just sit down with somebody and say, okay, this is my intention. These are the things that could go wrong, like the hand hand grenades. How are we going to get back on on track? Because I know when I've had those conversations before. I've left them not feeling good. I've mm. left them going, I wonder if that was okay or whether that was too much or whether that was not enough. And I wonder if they're okay. And the whole thing is just uncomfortable and awkward. And yeah. what do we do? We avoid the uncomfortable and, okay. and awkward. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. You know, if we're really clear that this is about you doing your job. This isn't personal. Yeah. This isn't about whether I like you, whether you're my mate, whether we go out for a beer on a Friday. This is about <laughs> me asking you to do your job in the way that I need you to do it. But it's also about me as a leader having other significant conversations in my toolkit that means I can support you where I need to. Yeah. I can coach you. I can um, signpost you if you're struggling. I have to have the full repertoire. 
I can't just have a hammer in my toolkit. I've got to have the full repertoire, which is why going back to where we started, seven significant conversations that every single manager, leader and HR professional needs to be able to have. Brilliant. Love it. So, Andrea, where can people find out more about you and your work? Um, the best place is probably on the website, confidentconversations.co.uk. Um, I'm always on LinkedIn, typically ranting yeah. and raging about something. Mm -hmm. And I'm also the host of a podcast called Really Useful Conversations. Um, it's a good podcast, that is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What a great name Thank as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, those really useful conversations do matter. And what I try to yeah. do within there is give people practical advice, help, um, yeah. how to have these conversations. But I also talk to guests about perhaps some of the topics that we should be talking about that we're not. Yeah. So the podcast is, is also a good place to, to learn a little bit more about how to have those conversations yourself. Great, great. I'm looking forward to diving into more episodes. I've listened to a few and they really are very practical. So, Andrea, there are two questions that I finish off and ask every guest. The first one is a quote or mantra that you live <laughs> by. Oh, the, there's a number, but I think the one that I am best known for is that sometimes you just have to put on your big girl pants and deal with it. Nice. I like that. And, and you know, Lisa, I've got construction workers who I've trained that will say to me, Andrea, is this a big girl pants conversation? And I'll go, yep, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so big girl pants come in boys colors too. Yeah. So yeah, big girl like pants. That. Nice. And a book, a book that's on your shelf that you refer to often that you think would be a good addition to anybody's shelf. I am a huge fan of Brené Brown. And I believe the book that a lot of people would do well to, to read is by Brené Brown and it's called um, Dare to Lead. And yeah. that book for me really summarizes a lot of what we've talked about today, having the courage to do the right thing, um, creating a climate where people feel safe and respected and you as a leader being prepared to be vulnerable and remain curious and not to presume that you know all the answers. And, and what she actually says is, we don't avoid difficult conversations and situations. We lean into the vulnerability that's necessary to do good work. And right. so that would be my the book that I would recommend. Yeah, it's awesome. Brené Brown's work is, is brilliant. And those books that you can read over and over, really, mm. really useful. It's been mm. wonderful having you as a guest on the podcast, Andrea. Thank you so much for your time today. You're very welcome. I've really enjoyed it. Once, uh, once I start ranting, <laughs> I can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been great. Thank you. And listeners, check out Andrea's uh, work over on confidentconversations.co.uk and uh, follow her and listen to her podcast. Great stuff. Thanks, Andrea. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.